Greetings, everyone, and welcome back. Um, we are having a great day focused on sports today. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Jay Tucker. I run the Center for Management of Enterprise and Media Entertainment and Sports, otherwise known as the Center for Memes. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the Pulse Conference as we continue our conversation on our third continent today. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to be able to introduce Emma Yamazaki, who's a documentarian, uh, a filmmaker who has done incredible work, um, really kind of giving you a sneak peek to culture, while at the same time uh, providing some great storytelling related to sport. Uh, I wanted to talk to her about her project, Koshien, um, which was released last year, as well as some other things that she's been working on um, and give you a little bit of a better sense of her career and um, how she's been able to really put other cultures on display. Um, first, it would make sense for you to have a better sense of what Koshien is, which is a documentary that's about a high school um, baseball tournament. Uh, I'm not going to try to describe it. Let's uh, give you a little peek at the at some of the video so you get a, a sense of what we're talking about, and then we'll take it from there. So please just run the video. Koshien is a sport. 高校生が野球やってたら、全員がそこに行きたい。もう本当にメジャーリーグで言ったらワールドシリーズみたいな場所なので。世の中で忘れられてるような純真さを皆さんが求めてるんじゃないかな。目的っていうのは野球と一緒に人間性を高めていく。おはようございます。ありがとうございます。おはよう。うちの子たちね、一生かけてフォローできるけれども、3年間しか入ってきた子たちには、やってあげられない。本当に見たことがないの。子供の試
and I grew up in Japan, but I, I decided to move to New York to study it. So ultimately, I feel like I was always interested in storytelling, even going back further. When I was a kid, I couldn't stop talking about the things that happened to me that day. You know, it was just like the smallest things I had the ability maybe to tell in a very dramatic way. And that's that's what my my roots are. And so ultimately, the medium of which I tell stories changed from speaking to dancing and now to to filmmaking. And so, you know, um, dancing and filmmaking are so visual. And I think being able to help people see what you see um, is just, it's, it's a wonderful skill to cultivate. But could you talk a little bit about your journey? You know, how did you get started, you know, with this? And why did you choose documentaries as opposed to fiction? Yeah, um, I, I guess I've always been interested in the world around me way more than what my limited imagination can create by writing a script or something like this. I mean, I did both in film school, but I realized that, you know, if I had two hours, I'd rather go out and interact with the real world than even watch a movie. <laughs> um, so I think that was just my nature. And I started to realize that if I can, um, like, I was interested in kind of using myself as a filter to you know, spend a long time like this baseball film, we were, you know, filming on and off for one year and then basically filtering it through my perspective and then expressing something. Um, and I know that's how fiction films often are made too. It's a director's vision, but I, I need or I prefer to use the inspiration of there's amazing stories and amazing people out there. And I have convinced myself that I have a unique perspective to see those things and the ability to share it, especially cross-culturally, you know, um, in, um, growing up in Japan with a British father and then spending almost 10 years in New York, I think I both have the insider and outsider perspective about Japan. And so, you know, Koshin really came about at a moment where I realized I should maximize on that, um, you know, telling kind of translating stories um, in a more complex way than what you often see about a different place. You know, Japan's known for its sushi and, you know, things that are cute, but there's also other other things that I thought I could, there was a gap there I saw that maybe I could I could serve. And it's funny, you know, you talk about being in New York for 10 years. I'm originally from New York City myself. And I would say if you're 10 years in, you're a New Yorker. Um, so this idea that you can um, see both cultures simultaneously and see how um, folks in one culture will view uh, the things that happen in another. Um, I think that's what really is a special gift and it's a special skill. And it comes through in the documentary. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the the film itself. Um, first of all, brava, um, just a wonderful depiction, not just of culture, but of baseball too. It's for, for those of us who are big baseball fans to see so much in terms of the preparation and the play in the documentary, even though it's about the people um, was really refreshing. Could you, you, you just teased out a little bit that um, you took quite a bit of time to film Koshien. Can you just walk through what the process was for making that happen? Yeah, so um, I'm also a big baseball fan or rather an Ichiro Suzuki fan. Um, I learned about him when I was a child and you ask about actually how I got into filmmaking. I feel like he made me realize and he meaning a book about him, not that I've ever spoken to him, but um, that I need to find something I want to do, pick something and then get really good at it. And, you know, um, and that's why I was actively looking for something I thought I could dedicate my life to and ultimately even going to New York to America where Ichiro chose to go despite him being the best in Japan. Um, all these things are, are related. But so baseball, I always knew was a sport that could, you know, reflect life. It's not just a sport, and that's also how I interacted with, with, with it, watching Ichiro. So, and when I um, when I decided, I made a, a, my first film, which is a totally different animated documentary about the authors of Curious George. I really realized what I was saying earlier that I I want to go to Japan, go back to Japan, and and pick something that I can look at to examine society. Um, and when I found out that Koshien was approaching his 100th tournament the following summer, 
Um, and also realizing having been away, like how extreme it is, <laughs> like it just shows the most extreme parts of Japanese society, I think, for better and worse. So it just seemed like a great arena to explore these themes. And it wasn't easy to even get permission. This has really never, almost never been done before the high school baseball union and various mm -hmm. sponsors have really been protective of this baseball world. Probably that's why a lot of Western audiences, even if you like baseball has not quite seen anything like this before you might have heard about the japanese crazy high school baseball tournament but um very few people have gotten access to it outside of japan and so there was a lot of negotiations and convincing and then we picked actually four teams to film because it's a knockout tournament so you don't know which you know there's four thousand schools and 50 make it to koshien so um even the best teams lose and we wanted to make sure one of our teams made it to koshien Ultimately, the film only has the two 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 schools, um, and then and I know the two main schools. I would say, and we filmed from uh, early spring through to the summer very intensely, and then kind of followed up in the fall and winter. But it was also about you know there's four schools. Which school do you go to? We only had one crew. It was me, the the producer, a camera person, and a sound person basically. So you know where do you go? I don't want to miss anything. There's also hundreds of kids on some of these teams, and we had to follow many many kids to end up with the few that we feature in the film. Um, ex extreme heat <laughs> just from morning. They they often practice from six in the morning till school starts at eight or eight thirty, and then back on the field from like two or three p.m. till night. And on the weekends, there's no school. So that's like all day. And we tried to be there as much as, you know, they were there. So it was um, it was very grueling. And ultimately, then there was a one year long editing process. We ended up with over 300 hours of footage, as well as access to 100 hours of archival materials, um, you know, kind of reflecting on the tournament as well. So, and I edited the film and it was, I could have made a hundred movies out of this footage and I ultimately picked um, what I did, but it, it took a while to, to figure that out, to, to, to be, be happy with that, yeah. 300 hours of footage that you guys were able to do as a single crew across four teams. How many cities? Four cities. And then how much time did you spend at the, at the actual tournament at the end? So, yeah, I mean, Koshien is a two week tournament and some of our teams made it to Koshien. Um, so we, we were there throughout. So the, so the two weeks, but actually we always knew that okay. the tournament itself, um, we, we weren't going to have as much access. Um, you know, we actually got some footage from our partner. We partnered with NHK to get some of the tournament footage. So we actually spent some of that tournament time filming people watching the tournament, filming the teams that didn't make it to the tournament, things like this as well. But um, so we split our time that way. Now you um, talked about the <laughs> grueling schedule that the players had that you, um, you know, took advantage of when you were capturing your footage. Can you talk a little bit more about the culture of baseball in Japan? I mean, double practices daily, all day practice on Saturday seems kind of intense for a kid who's 15 or 16 years old. Yeah, and I think it comes from the history of the sport. Um, as you saw a little bit in the, the trailer, and we do a little bit of that in the, the main film as well. Um, when baseball was imported into Japan from the U.S. in the late 1860s, early 1870s, there was no such thing as sports in Japan. The word didn't exist. The concept didn't exist. We all only had martial arts. And so what I've, what I've learned, what happened was it was incorporated into youth education as a martial art. Even baseball, right now we call it um, baseball, but the name uh, at the time reflected, it was a different, a slightly different name that reflected it being a martial art. So it was like a way of life and training right from the beginning. So I understand in the US, baseball is a more fun game thing, they, you know, kind of like towns, amateur, you know, like baseball started in, in these different towns across the country, it was always first targeted by students, um, university students, then into high school. Professional baseball started much later than, than student baseball, you know, in the 1930s when Babe Ruth came over and Japanese people realized, oh, we could make money off of baseball instead of it just being part of education. So that was an afterthought. So that tradition remains where it's not just about 
the skills of baseball. I mean, even that main team with Coach Mizutani in the trailer, there's a hundred, there was 129 kids the year we filmed, and only 20 will ever play in a 18 game. <laughs> so the others, they're there to you know learn how to be better people, learn how to greet people better, learn how to be organized, learn how to dedicate yourself to things. These are skills that you that it supposedly will help you um, when you're an adult. So that's like the mentality. The kids are not no no kid while we were filming quit just because they couldn't play baseball. I mean, some of these kids barely played baseball for three years, you know, in a way or, or not, not in the, not in games at least. So it's, it's very much a way of life that you learn. And it's just very, is treated very intensely as you might've seen a little bit from the trailer. It's not, of course the kids have fun, but it's really um, very, a very serious affair. And, and, you know, it's funny that comes across in the documentary very, very clearly, the level of intensity um, and the dedication, right? I think you shared the story of one student who was trying to get his weight up, so he's eating more to try to, to put on pounds, and he's being critiqued for not you know, putting on enough weight. We had kids who um, were cleaning up the field and the town, you know, before and after practices and so on, that this went well beyond you know, what we normally think of as dedication to your craft. This was really was a way of life. And I feel like um, one of the things you're trying to show was a contrast in coaching styles as well. That, you know, you had one coach who was very, very traditional and essentially his protege, somebody who learned the game from him, but was actually more successful than he was as a coach, um, who was questioning the degree to which some of these traditional methods were really helpful. And I thought that was really interesting too. Yeah, so um, one thing I would add maybe to that previous question is this, it's all about the team. Um, it's all about you find your role in the team and you dedicate yourself to it. So that might be if you're not the best players, that might be like taking care of the grounds, cleaning the toilets, you know, everything, you know, you find your roles and you're responsible for it and you learn to be useful that way. It's all about self-sacrifice in a way for the team. And again, in the U.S., I believe baseball, I mean, it is a team sport, but there's always star players. If you had one good player that per and one good hitter, they would just be practicing hitting because that's what they would be contributing the team as there's no such thing everybody is treated even the star players have to do certain things it's all about you know giving up yourself to the to the greater cause which is also i think a, a trait of japanese society at least until now and kind of what we're known for associated with this idea of dedicating yourself to a company for forever um often overworking you know the, these type of things and i think yes what we tried to what i tried to show was through the two coaches and actually also, so there's a main coach, Mizutani, who we followed the most. And his protege, as you mentioned, is actually Shohei Otani and Yusei um, Kikuchi, two major leaguers. He, they're they're uh, coach in high school. So we picked uh, the high school that Shohei Otani went to. And you can see that as the generations pass, the base is still there, you know, the idea of hard work and dedication, but the methods and qu questioning things that, you know, the answer has always been that way. Why are they shaved heads? It's always been that way. Why do you have to practice for so long every day? He was questioning those ideas and, 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 and if he wasn't convinced by the answers, he was willing to make changes. And I think that's where Japanese society has arrived at, you know, with, um, it's been a long time since like, you know, like since the war, <laughs> you know, the post-war mentality where everybody had to just dedicate themselves and work really hard. That should be over. Yet I sometimes feel like Japanese people um, still sometimes behave as though this, uh, like, I mean, the fact that there's so many issues with overworking and suicide rates, like the society is not as happy as I feel like it could be, I think um, is attributed to, you know, the mentality of a little bit before. And I think that is changing, you know, I, in the trailer, there was a thing about change, you know, the society's rethinking how we work. There's a big um, kind of change in the past few years. I'm kind of having new laws. So people only work a certain amount of hours a week, which is like a huge change in Japan, um, this type of thing. So um, I think we caught a moment where society was thinking about these changes. And ultimately, my question as I filmed high school baseball was a bigger question about, so what parts of Japanese society should be kept, should be protected because they're good, and then what things should change. That was ultimately what I was wondering and the theme I tried to kind of continue throughout throughout the film. Incredible. And I, and I 
wonder, you know, if you could talk a little bit about your thought process when you were in the editing room, you had so much to choose from, right? So many examples of individuals, their families, the teams, et cetera. Um, and what we saw is just amazing. But I have to imagine there were moments that you captured that you knew were very much in line with what you just described, right? This question about, mm -hmm. you know, how folks are supposed to live. Um, that might've been really poignant examples that you choo chose to leave on the cutting room floor. Can you talk a little bit more about that editing process? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's hard to imagine now, but when I had basically finished filming, I didn't even know who would be the main character. The main character ultimately became the coach of the main team, but, you know, when I was filming, I was so with the kids, like I felt like I was living my youth again, you know, cheering them on and, you know, devastated when certain teams lost or certain te you know, happy when certain teams won. I was so with them that it was only later in the editing room I realized that, you know, the, it's the coach that I was most interested in because for kids, it's once in their life, their senior year of high school, they give it their all and then they win or lose, usually lose, I mean, except for the one team that wins coach yet right. and then move on. And it's devastating, um, but they move on and they become adults. But the coaches, like Misatani has been doing this for almost 30 years. And when you realize how hard it is every year, and he's only made it to coach yet once. So, you know, it, uh, um, so basically you realize how it's a, it's a repetitive thing that he goes through. And um, also because his mentor, his mentor was this epic uh, war, who, uh, epic coach who fought in World War II as a kamikaze pilot. And then he has now, his protege has surpassed him. Um, he's, he's in this very unique situation where um, if you follow his life, you see more than just one year of high school baseball. You kind of see the generations. And then his own, his own son, joining that uh, high school of his protege. And because he's been dedicated to his team for so so long, he's never watched his son play high school, play baseball at all. Um, those ideas kind of go into the idea of family in Japan. I think a lot of people were shocked. Um, the Western audience was shocked to hear this. That, oh my God, you know, this father has never seen his own son play baseball, yet he's a, high, a baseball coach. But um, again, not now maybe, but until very recently, this was a typical figure of a Japanese father so dedicated to his work that he was never really expected to partake that much in family life and the measure of a good father was not necessarily how much time you spent with your children it was more about how how dedicated you were to your job and so those questions and that kind of insight I wanted to also share but also that's shifting now um i think that's now a little bit surprising even for, for a japanese person to hear but i just took different opportunities to make sure um all the the baseball the themes i saw in high school baseball were being uh spread out to the rest of society ultimately yeah it was a it took many tries to to get to the film we did um in the western way of storytelling you know we did a lot of test screenings and i feel like often you're encouraged to pick one main character and kind of go with it so um mm -hmm. during the process a lot of people suggested i just forget it not forget about everybody else but even further lessen the other characters the second coach some of the kids and i i decided against that ultimately but i had to figure out a way that when i do shift from another to another coach or, or a student instead of the coach creating that emotional path so people could now be with that character versus the coach because they're on opposite ends um, but I tried to do my best to craft this, the multi-layered stories because I just couldn't tell the story of Japanese high school baseball through just one person. It's, it's interesting because you just touched on a question that um, someone in our audience wanted to know, which was how you balanced the perspectives of, you know, North Americans and Japanese uh, folks who would be in your audience and who'd be watching this film. And, you know, I, I, I hear pieces of that answer in what you just said. I, I would kind of pull back, um, you know, even a little further and ask the question a little bit differently. Clearly, you had a motivation when you decided that this was something that you wanted to, to work on. And you had a point of view, which I'm sure evolved, obviously, as you actually spent time with the teams, the players, and so on. But when you got to the point where you were thinking about, okay, well, now we have a film um, and decided what to leave in, what to take out, how to refine it, um, how much of that 
was kind of staying true to a vision that you had about the story you wanted to tell versus um, trying to package the vision in, in a way that would be more digestible, say, for an American audience or for a Japanese audience? Yeah, um, a, a few things for sure. I think the fact that we always knew this was going to be the Goshien film that would in, make it to the world. I mean, there's plenty of domestic programming about this, but that was what we set out to do. Um, made me realize, you know, I had to do a lot of test screenings, you know, first to people who don't know anything about Japan or baseball, and then to people who like know baseball, but not about Japan, different groups, because as much as I didn't want it to just be an explanatory, wordy thing about the system and all this, if you don't get certain concepts, then, you know, I felt the story would be lost. So finding that balance of having just enough explanation for the majority of people to to follow without being confused. That was something we really did. And, you know, we must have shown it to a few hundred people before we decided the film was done, testing these things, especially to the outside audience, because in Japan, you don't need to explain what Koshien is, you don't need to explain the system, these kind of things. But I didn't want, also want to over explain, you know, have used text too much to explain cultural things that I hope we could convey visually to, a, to an audience that would pay attention. So that was something that um, we we really focus on, and ultimately, I feel like at the beginning I had to pick like that was it was prioritizing the international audience. But but what happened was when you do that, then Japanese people when they saw this film saw high school baseball in a way that they'd never seen before. You know, because of that oh. additional perspective. Even our camera person, uh, Michael Cromet, he'd never been to Japan. He came to Japan and without speaking Japanese, shot this film for us. And he he's so moved by the helmets in line, the shoes in line, things that even I, you know, forget to appreciate sometimes because it's so normal. And for a Japanese person, we don't they don't think twice. So accentuating those themes made Japanese people see their own culture kind of in a, in a new light. That's, that's at least what a lot of people said, which was an effect that I hope to achieve, but wasn't as sure as the international aspect. But um, that that's one thing. Um, and then I guess, yeah, it's it's. I had this idea that if we look at high school baseball, there'll be answers to to, you know, it'll be a, a way to think about where Japan has come from, where we are now, and where we might be headed. But I I always try to make sure when I'm going into a project, I don't have like this is what I want to convey, you know, because especially in a long-term project, I like to keep an open mind. I have my theories and I have themes I want to, you know, explore, but I think it's almost dangerous to to do that because, you know, what if you're, you know, it's harder for you to shift gears when you realize your assumptions have been wrong. So that balance is always um, important for me. And I think um, I, I learned so much during the year of high school baseball. I mean, we filmed for 300 hours, but I must have spent over a thousand hours just in that environment. And even the other schools that aren't in the film, you know, helped me get informed about what high school baseball culture is right now, which I kind of absorbed through myself and put it, you know, kind of put it like intensely into the uh, 94 minutes that, that are there. But I do think that um, ultimately, yeah, there's the idea that I had, I knew where to look and I knew what to look for ended up, it wasn't like I had no idea what this film was going to be like. I'll, actually, when I finished the film and had a chance to look back on the first written treatment I wrote for the film, it was exactly like the film. Turned, I just didn't know the specifics. I can wow. tell you who, who would win, who would, you know, um, who, which kids will make it onto the team, this kind of thing. And and I would say, sorry, this is a long answer, but um, I, um, the the result of the film was dictated by how the teams that we followed did and i don't want to give a major spoiler but i but you know um basically the results of how the, the teams that we followed kind of were self you know i we use that you know actually um we we hope we hoped all the teams would make it to koshian but when the results presented itself i did, we decided to tell the story using those results so um i think i would have had a harder time for example if um mizutani's team who's kind of this old old school way um they don't make it to koshian you know and if they had i would have had a harder time to figure out so what does that mean so the old old school way this tough way is still the way to go but because they didn't make it to koshian in this historic uh, year, 
um, I feel like that in itself gave me the reason to 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 say something without saying something. So you know, acknowledging mm -hmm. that maybe times are changing, that this style isn't the way to win anymore and isn't working as well as other other styles that the younger coaches are coming up with. And so it's funny because you got, you got me thinking about two or three things as you're talking about it. First, I want to say um, I totally understand the idea of Japanese people watching the film and being able to see the way they treat baseball with new eyes because of the perspective that you used. I will say as an American you know, baseball player, baseball fan, as somebody who's coached Little League and all this other stuff too, um, in the same way, that listening to interviews with Ichiro um, really left me with a lot to think about. The film made me rethink the beauty of the game itself, right? There are still moments, um, you, you mentioned um, the shoes and the helmets being lined up and stuff like that. But I think the, the, um, the zeal with which the, the players practiced the passion they had for wanting to win, wanting to succeed, even the kids who didn't get to play on the field and are in the stands, you know, it just reminds you that the game itself is this very, very beautiful, precious thing that we can share. Um, and I appreciate the way, the kind of, um, the loving way in which you put that on display too, right? Um, and the other thing, you know, just listening to you talk about this inflection point for Japan, so I, I, I'm a little older than you are. Um, I'm, in, I'm a Gen Xer. One of the things about Gen X in North America that, that is a running theme is that we had something like, I don't know, less than an hour a week of one-on-one -on -one time with trusted adults, right? With our parents or you know loved ones, right? Grown guardians. Um, but when we were growing up, we were told it was quality time, <laughs> right? We had the same kind of um, company first mentality in our families and the same expectation for fathers back in the 50s and 60s and really into the early 70s um, that I think you saw in Japanese culture as it is changing. And it, it has changed in the United States. We know with the millennial generation here that parents really did try to figure out a way to make home work and to spend more time with their kids, to pay more attention to what happens in school, to celebrate the victories and milestones that the, the children experience and so on in a way that was just not even thinkable back in the 70s. And I hope that your project in some way gets people to, to begin that journey, right? Folks who had never really considered it. I hope that it get, gets people on that journey to start rethinking, you know, the importance of people over things. And I, and I hear you when you say that, you know, one of the other things we see in this film is this um, appreciation for the collective, right? It's not about me, mm -hmm. it's about the team. It's not about me, it's about the company. Um, but the family unit is also, right, one of the teams that matters. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, folks have to figure out that balance. And I love the way you showed um, people in the film questioning that mm -hmm. and using these salient examples. You mentioned Shoei Otani, who's in the film. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, and you can see that relationship between players and coaches even after they've gone on to much greater success. Yeah, and I think what's what's interesting is, you know, for the international audience through these test screenings, I wanted to make sure that at least to the majority of the audience, what I want, intended to convey this idea of, you know, providing hints into why Japan is the way it is. Um, are p potentially presented, you know, if you've ever been to Japan and you were like, wow, the trains on time and people are, you know, line up for everything. What an amazing place. And, but why, you know, if you've had a business vision, why is this my, my Japanese counterpart? Like, why does he work on Sundays? It's, this is though he doesn't have a family. Like these, these kind of various questions you might've had good and bad about Japanese society. I feel like if you watch this film, you understand a little bit. Um, I didn't plan on this, but I feel like now with the COVID times, Japan has been relatively successful in um, take, you know, dealing with, with COVID. And I think retroactively, if you see how considerate we are about our group, you know, feeling responsible that we owe it to our surroundings to act in a responsible way, to wear masks, to be socially distant. You know, we already were very clean anyway. This type of, like, it would be kind of, you know, there were the traits in society that, 
prepared us for this. We also are a country of lots of earthquakes and typhoons. And, you know, we, right. we grew up with this mentality that there are limitations to your life and, and the world um, and you have to live by them, um, which I think is sometimes often different from the U.S. way where you, you're you're told everything, anything is possible and, you know, you're free and you can dream big, which is also a wonderful part about the U.S. But maybe, you know, that is also hard when all of a sudden things are not, you know, restricted and you have a hard time dealing with that. But so it's that that was my goal with the international audience. But in Japan, what's interesting and what I also think is why I love documentary filmmaking and the kind of films I hope to continue making is that you, I show the same film and depending on already your opinion about high school baseball or how happy you are with Japanese society the way it is, people walking away from this film saying, oh, like, I rediscovered how amazing high school baseball is. This stuff is so great. Like we need to protect and preserve this culture for another hundred years. And then this like the opposite extreme is like, oh, like this totally shows the militaristic side of Japan that we haven't left since like the war time. <laughs> the, the people sitting next to each other leave with this range of um, kind of uh, opinion, but also, so I always like to say, all I want to do is provide like a, a multiplication with someone's uh, original perspectives through the film they might have one revelation they might my hope is that they leave thinking oh like you know I, I thought this but maybe it's, it's more complicated you know what I fear is sometimes um, because I I am also critical of certain parts of Japanese society it's hard not to be when you leave a place and you see I see both the good and bad parts of it but what I'm worried about is you know Japan's at this moment of change and I just hope the kind of the right things change um you know i think if like because i don't think a typical japanese person appreciates trains being on time it's so normal and i didn't either until i went to new york or other places and you know, <laughs> you just know what the is coming. Yeah. but um yeah but i think the, the, the schedule so in new york is just example, a suggestion <laughs> yeah so 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 if these last, it is extreme and high school baseball is extreme and i think that some things should should be changed but i think the un unintended consequences you know in 30 years when those boys are ruling society you know the trains might be less on time a few minutes late in japan as a, as a result and maybe that's okay but i don't think people are seeing the connections because in japan the, the wonderful things about society are so normal you know and and the so the, i just wanted to provide that link that you know i'm not i don't have the answers i think experts in all the fields different industries should think about these things i'm not saying i know what to do about high school baseball or how to better japanese society but presenting these links so that people can have more to think about is is my goal and i think uh this, this film did that at least um domestically in japan see the interesting thing though i listened to you talk about spending 300 hours capturing film and spending a thousand hours working on the project and spending countless hours observing coaches and players and seeing the results. I suspect at this point, you'd make a pretty fair baseball coach. I I don't think I want that job. Like being- I, I didn't say you want the job. I think it's like the hardest thing. I think that's why, you know, what I came out of it is because because again, in, in Japan and maybe also Westerners seeing this film, they they can see like it's, you know, it's too much. You know, people have various criticism. There's also things about pitch throw, throw, throwing counts that are often uh, criticized by by the media, things like this. And but it's just really difficult, I think, you know, it's one thing to kind of be in the stands wishing for these things to be better. And that's important. But when you're you're basically in charge of educating the next generation, that's what these they, this that's what they're doing. Every high school baseball coach has to be a teacher, has to be a actually licensed teacher to be a coach. It's not like in other systems where you just come for the coaching. So they they're educators, they're teachers. And so on the ground every day trying to figure out what things to keep from your previous year of coaching and what to change like in real time being ahead and then you won't know maybe your results until in 30 years when those ki kids are you know you know grow middle middle aged you know and so it's a very mm -hmm. difficult thing and i i feel like that's what i i took away and i definitely don't <laughs> want to one year was enough for me to, to be in that be in that world but hopefully i can contribute to society in other ways <laughs> Understood. So one of the things that I wanted to make sure I asked you this time, which I, I never have, um, 
such a, you know, this is an example of a, of, of a project and a story that people wouldn't appreciate the value until they saw it completed. And at the same time, the expense and the time and the investment of, you know, getting everybody to Japan, spending all the time filming and editing and all sort of stuff means that you had to convince camera crew, investors, you know, the coaches, the high schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that this was a thing that was worth doing and that you had a vision that was going to make this all worthwhile. Can you talk a little bit about how you pitched this idea and what worked and what didn't? Um, because I think that is a really, really um, interesting aspect of this, particularly for those of us, you know, as business school types who are going to be out there pitching new businesses and new ideas. And sometimes who are going to be in the position that you were in trying to kind of uh, unite multiple cultures to achieve an objective. Yeah, I think um, what I love about being a documentary filmmaker is that it forces me to continue to grow and be a better person every day because it takes a certain kind of person, I think, to to be convincing that you want, you know, whether it's crew or the subjects or organizations to let you make a film that, as you said, you know, it's not like society knows it needs <laughs> until you see it. Um, and it's like kind of this additional, you know, it's often a, very much a burden as much as a special experience. And people realize maybe at the end that it was worth it, but there are hard times in between and to convince them to keep, to, for you to keep at it. Um, and I think what's worked with, with me is this combination of you know, for even the Koshen project, we we partner with NHK, the public broadcaster, to to do this. So there was this kind of, you know, like people in Japan kind of trust NHK, are like comfortable with it. But also this idea that like New Yorkers, and like Americans, were coming all the way from a faraway land to do this, and like that kind of that special, you know, being us, you know, the my the producer, the the camera person, that were all all non Japanese. And that special, special feeling that, you know, someone might get that they're getting this kind of attention and combining those two things wisely. So get, you know, having the trust. So it's not like who are these outsiders, but also kind of leaning into like the special experience that we hope to provide. Like towing that balance, I think, was what we did throughout. No, no, leaning in on the 100th tournament. Like we just knew we had to do it that year and not a later year to convince the, the union and the organization. So, but I think it's this combination of, of, yeah, like, again, like what I said earlier, like the selling yourself as an insider and an outsider, you know, it's different from people that are no, no Japan at all coming in to do this. Like, I also think that's quite difficult and often doesn't result in good things when you come in for a week and shoot something, you know, this is why I came back to Japan because I was kind of annoyed at all the TV programs that would fly into Japan for a week and show something weird about Japan that even Japanese people found weird, but, you know, showed it as though we found it normal and it's just weird to the outsiders. This I was getting annoyed at that. So having that understanding while the outlet and the, 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 the language to to communicate it to the outside world. Um, but I think, yeah, it's it's difficult. And, and, and honestly, this film is a miracle that we got it done, you know, um, for, for various, for the permissions to just the schools letting us be there every day. Um, and I think it's gonna, it's a huge, um, it's a great confidence booster for, for myself as I continue to make films that I, I did this and, and we can do things like this um, with enough persistence and determination. Yeah, and, and I wanna come back to something that you mentioned before that I know that the audience doesn't about the fact that this was not your first documentary and that you did tell a story about the creators of Curious George. Can you talk a little bit about that project? Yeah, so the, the Koshen is my second feature. My first feature was about the authors of Co Curious George called uh, Monkey Business, The Adventures of Curious George's Creators. And the authors of Curious George were a husband and wife team, German Jews who fled the Nazis on bicycles, carrying that first Curious George book with them. So when I was uh, 24 and learned about this story, I was so shocked that no film had been made about them yet and i was um as i spent three years making it i was very scared that at any moment someone like mr spielberg would find out about it and make a make a movie about it it was such an amazing story but um i got to tell it it's one third animated so in the style of inspired by the world of the curious george 
books, but then combined with harsh archival footage to kind of show the realities also of um, what they went through. I tried to think about how, how would the authors tell their own story because they were such wonderful storytellers. And I think at the time um, I was, you know, I, I still am, but I want to, I also want to become a storyteller that my films remain after I'm gone, just like the Curious George authors. And the, that was a huge motivation and the way I also, I think, to, told the story of that film. Very different from Koshien, you know, historic, you know, people are, the, the main subjects are long dead. So um, I think the two films show the, the possibility of documentary filmmaking that the same director can do that and that just means it takes a team you know i can't draw but i get to make an animated documentary with the right words and the right team so that's what that that project showed me amazing and speaking about possibilities you're working on a new project now right yeah yeah so um it's almost like a i i think this next film i'm going to make is like a second chapter to like building off of the Koshien film, honestly. Um, next, I will be in a Japanese public elementary school for one year, filming the incoming first graders as well as the outgoing sixth graders um, as a focus, because I really think that between ages six and 12 is when these ideas of what it means to be a Japanese are solidified. You know, there's, you know, everybody has a role like you. Some people open the windows every day. Other people clean the chalk, clean the, the blackboard. Everybody has a role and it's all about the group again, but it's kind of bringing it down to taking the sport element out a little bit and focusing more purely on the educational forming of a human and what that means now going from the like the COVID to the post-COVID world. We don't know if um, the Olympics will happen, um, but if they do, or even if they don't, I believe this next year, started, school starts in April here. So in the next 12 months, Japan will face again, like, so where are we headed after summer of 2021? So I'm again, p picking the arena of classrooms, but thinking about these similar topics about, you know, what should remain and what should change and ultimately where, where Japan might be headed. And the interesting thing, as you mentioned earlier, Japan has been so responsible about um, being safe with respect to the pandemic that you can actually film school with students in the schoolrooms, um, which is something yeah. that would be very difficult to do in, in the U.S. right now. So that in yeah. of itself is a blessing. Yeah, I mean, Japan's been, you know, schools closed last spring, but fully operating since last June, almost for nine months now. And yeah, we can do it. And and when you see how kids behave and what they're learning in elementary school, you understand why Japan has handled COVID okay. I mean, they they follow the rules, they do as they're told, and they understand that responsibility. So I think that's why, even though when I conceived this project, it was way before COVID times, it makes sense to do it now, even though we have to, you know, take precautions and everybody will be masked. I still think there's a there's a point to doing this project uh, this year. All right. So I see that we've kind of exceeded our time, but I will ah. say that it's always a pleasure to spend some time with you and talk about your work. Um, you know, I love to always, I always love chopping it up with a, a fellow baseball aficionado um, but I love your work. I'm a big fan of your work. I'm looking forward to this next project. I couldn't be happier for the success of Koshien. I wish you continued success, and I thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, no, thank you. It was, it was amazing to have this chat, and good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Um, that's it for today's uh, Pulse Conference. We'll be back tomorrow morning um, with an author, uh, athlete, and activist to kick off the day. Um, and we'll have lots of cool stuff to follow. So once again, thanks to Emma Yamazaki. Thank you for joining us and good night.